Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Amplify Your Business. Today, I am talking to Evan Wayne. He is the co-founder of a business called Order, which is absolutely fascinating, and I can't wait to get into it. So welcome to the show, Evan. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. So we met, I guess, probably about two, maybe three weeks ago. It was at Launch Party, which was an event that Edmonton Unlimited had, and you were one of the companies who were pitching that night. Tell me about that experience. Yeah, so that was a bit of a neat experience for us because we launched our car, our company pretty much at the beginning of like we we formed a uh, a team, co-founded it in the middle of the beginning of um, COVID uh, in August 2020. So uh, that was actually our first in-person pitch as founders, even though we've been raising money and pitching for two years and like feel like we're old hats at it sometimes always learning every time but yeah uh, that was actually our first in-person pitch event well and it was unique in the sense that the room was full of about 700 people who had lots of drinks in them and uh, were standing up and socializing and you had to be up there on the stage trying to capture their attention and communicate what it was that you have as far as a business and the opportunity that you see in front of you how unnerving was that uh, you know, from my standpoint, I used to be a teacher and like my day to day was public speaking. And so like, I'm, I'm fairly comfortable at it now, but, uh, that definitely is not my like personal jam. Like I <laughs> yeah. am introverted by nature. So public speaking is not something that I, I will choose to do, but, um, yeah, it was nerve wracking. Cause there's a lot of people there you want to present well, yeah. um, and uh, it was a it was three minute pitch. So there's a time limit and making sure that you're clear, concise, and making sure that uh, people like are listening to you. Those are all three things that uh, uh, can that went into the pre event nerves. Yeah, for sure. Well, and you did a great job. So congratulations on that. Now, before we get into what order is in terms of a business, what problem you're trying to solve there, tell me what are three things that every entrepreneur needs to know? Yeah. So biggest thing for me is uh, the first thing would be just start, right? Just start something. So many people give themselves their uh, no and they don't give themselves permission to just try things. Um, I think like for me in particular, entrepreneurship doesn't mean quitting your job and starting your business and, and, and grinding off the, the, off the hop. Um, I started with working on in evenings and on weekends um and in the early morning prior to my day job yeah right so you don't need to quit your day job uh i think that's a really good thing for you to keep but you should try things like the average person they say has about one or two ideas a year that would actually make them wealthy but the reason why people don't the biggest reason is they don't start they don't even try right so um i started doing things to uh get out of my comfort zone and I started going to, it was then Startup Edmonton, um, pre-flights and uh, met a bunch of people over there and just started doing the homework and uh, networking and trying to connect with people. Um, and that's how I met my business partner uh, currently is just doing homework on a completely different idea. Um, so number one would be just try something. Like, yeah, sounds uh, good. Number two. Try something. Uh, don't be afraid to be shameless. Um, I don't care who I'm contacting uh, or anything like that. Uh, they're just people and in business, people are motivated by making money. And um, if I believe in my product and believe in my company and believe what I have, um, I want them to look good too. So everybody's trying to look good. Everybody wants to try find something that's really good. So um, if you believe in what you're doing, um, People are people. Uh, if you can make them look good, um, they're going to help you. And uh, I've had midnight conversations with uh, the Wolf of Wall Street, Jordan Belfort. He called us at no way. Yeah, like what? nine, ten o'clock at night. Called us and um, was uh, uh, really interested in what we were doing. It wasn't t- timing wasn't right for either party at that time, but I came off of a cold email. Our lead investor was a Facebook message. Hmm. That's uh, incredible. That we, That's and, really cool. Yeah. And like most of our early business was 
me just adding people on LinkedIn or uh, emailing people out of the blue, uh, like the worst you can get is a no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you have to have that thick skin to be turned down a lot, right? Uh, but I, I love your advice is just get out there and friggin' start doing it. And then, you know, don't be concerned about the no's. You never, yeah. you're never going to get a yes unless you ask, right? Yeah, it's a numbers game. It's a numbers yeah. game. You talk to more people, you're going to get more yeses. Yeah, right? really cool. And people have preloaded for no's. Like yeah. even myself, like uh, yeah. people are, they're, they're like, yeah, I can't wait to give you the no. Um, <laughs> but it's just about uh, getting in front of people and, and, uh, and learning. Um, and then my third is um, it's going to take longer than you expect, than you want it to. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be a roller coaster. So the key is trying to keep yourself, you don't get too high, you don't get too low. Uh, and just maintaining composure, like celebrate your wins, but you're not going to take over the planet with your first win. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, all three really good points. I love it. Um, I want to dig into more of your, your outreach to the Wolf of Wall Street. I think that's really cool. But first, tell us a little bit about order. What is it that you guys are trying to solve over there? Yeah. So uh, with order, we're trying to bring the premium experience to everybody at live events. Um, so I was fortunate in, my, I've been fortunate in my life to have some premium experiences, um, being that in a suite or in club seating where you're able to get like in seat service and like, a, like a, a real great experience at events. And I'm a big sports fan in general. Um, however, like even in like, I'm going to call them the cheap seats, which is where I'm normally at for, yep. for games is in the cheap seats still three four hundred dollars depend at uh like uh for local sport teams here and stuff like that's still quite a bit of money yep and if my partner and i had went to a restaurant and spent three four hundred dollars that would be pretty much the night of our life like we were going to be treated uh quite well yeah. um, and i'm not saying that they don't treat people well at uh these local events but it's there's a like if you went to a game for $400, the average wait time in line is 20, 30 minutes uh, at the pro sports level. You spend 20 minutes in line. You just spent 40 bucks to stand in line. Yeah. Right. So um, I'd much rather stay in my seat. And that's what order does. It allows you to get in seat delivery anywhere in the venue um, or express pickup from whatever concession that you order at. So you're not skipping the play to beat the line. You're going to get your stuff when it's marked ready or it's coming to you and you don't have to leave. Yeah. And so essentially you're like a skip the dishes in a way kind of service model for people who are at venues. And so they can skip the line essentially. Yeah. Right. And uh, order from their phone, I presume that's going to put the order into the kitchen. Somebody's going to make it and then somebody's going to bring it to your seat. Exactly. Yeah. It's a very apt uh, comparison there. Yeah. Great. Now, what I'm curious about is you had said that you uh, started this at the very beginning of COVID uh, at a time in which there was no no venues there's that were open. There was none of this happening. And so um, that must have been a pretty nerve wracking experience as well, because like, will we ever return <laughs> or when will that happen uh, to these large venue uh, activities and stuff where you have a need for a product like yours? Yeah. So um, one thing I try to live by is in the challenge is the opportunity, yeah. right? Um, if there's no challenge, there's no opportunity, right? And like people pay for convenience, people pay to make their life easier. Um, and so that was kind of our our thought process. The other thing that comes with with COVID, I'm I'm, I'm generally optimistic with a side of skepticism, um, but uh, we we made a bet that live events were going to happen, right? We there has been pandemics in the past, and life does typically go back to normal. Um, we did figure, uh, we did figure um, that there would be a couple of years where things would be slow before it gets back to normal. And, uh, and just based off of the historical record that we've done with pand that pandemics have happened is there's about two, three years of disruption and then you get back to normal. Yeah. Um, and so while that's a great little window to develop some new tech, all our competitors are also paused 
potential competitors are also paused because there's no no venues um and we had the privilege of not having to burn through a ton of capital or lay people off um during that pandemic it was just me and my co-founder building an mvp uh raising our first round of money and then building our beta um and now we're at an enterprise level solution so yeah yeah i think that's a really good point in terms of the timing if you if it would have happened potentially you if you guys were like two years ahead of the pandemic and you staffed up and everything now you're dealing with a totally different scenario that that might have been really problematic because you have a cost structure that's aligned with a revenue stream and that revenue stream would have would have disappeared and it, for that, that period of time of the disruption right and so yeah. Because you guys were pre-revenue, because it was just the two of you and you're working on it from the corners of your desks and whatnot, that made it a lot more viable for you to continue developing that. So I think that is a really good point. Um, timing is an interesting thing, right? Like it's a curse or it's a gift. And I think yeah. you were maybe gifted with timing on this one. So yeah. so tell me a little bit about uh, where you're at now, because uh, I think you said about a year ago was your first location install from a beta standpoint. And uh, now you've you've got deals right across North America. So walk me through, I guess, the last year here. Yeah, so uh, it's funny, like uh, I was just talking with my co-founder about like, we tend to focus on the granular and we forget to look at the like step back. Um, and like the startup path is like that, right? But if you're doing it correctly, looked over time, it goes, like it's a lot more smooth. and. Um, so we started with our beta venue and with five weeks of launch, uh, we signed the Canadian Elite Basketball League to a national deal. And so within five weeks, we had went from one venue to 11, um, 11 venues within the network. That's um, exciting. Yeah. And then throughout the year, we added a few more venues. Um, I believe the numbers, uh, it's about 4 million annual attendances in the venues that we are currently in, wow. uh, which is like to me that's an unfathomable number that like um and like the reach is expanding and then uh we we signed a, a deal and an integration deal with a company called spot on point of sale uh which uh i might be wrong but i believe it's about 60 percent of pro sports um use a spot on point of sale system um which would allow us to just um turn on our system versus having to do new tech new training or anything like that so that came on board in the late spring while well, that that was in the early spring that deal was signed integration was completed in in the summer um and now uh we're uh getting inbound leads from nfl teams nhl teams uh, and starting to starting to get bigger in the big leagues yeah uh, yeah we've recruited patrick laforge uh oh, awesome. yeah he's the ex-ceo of the oilers if you don't if your listeners don't uh, recognize the name, he was their CEO for roughly 15 years. Um, that guy's got stories and wealth of business experience and knowledge that um, both me and my co-founder, like we like to be sponges and learn from people who've done it before. Yep. Um, and our lead investor is a multi-unicorn founder. And uh, like he, this summer, it's funny, we met him in person for the first time in August. And um, uh, he's like, you guys are frustrating because uh, my go-to is I told you so. And you guys ask advice, I give it, and then you do it. Um, so I can't say I told you so. Whereas, <laughs> and he's like, I have other people that I've given mentorship to, and they tell me I'm wrong. And I say, you're right. <laughs> That's funny. So with Patrick, what role is he playing then? Is he an advisor or? Um... Yeah, he's he's been an advisor at a Fractional CBO. Yeah, that's yeah. really great. I, I think that that's just absolutely fantastic. And so how did you end up landing a whale like Patrick? And then obviously this, this uh, lead investor who is also uh, a massive whale too. Yeah, so um, I'll start with, I'll start with Rick because that's further in the past. Uh, so my co-founder, Jade Childs, messaged him on Facebook um, that he had listened to him on a podcast, really loved like his perspective on things and uh, uh, that he had said in that podcast. 
and said, I uh, asked if we could set up a call. We asked him for mentorship, uh, not for money, because like we believe that a, a good mentor is not financially motivated. Um, and then we'd have monthly calls with him uh, about where our progress was. And then about six months after meeting us, he said, uh, if you don't let me invest, uh, I'm not picking up your phone calls anymore. Um, I, I love what you guys are doing. And the, he invests in people, not ideas. Yeah. Um, and teams, which is to me the best way to invest because people are predictable. Um, and uh, you can trust the founders. The idea can be ripped off right? Um, the founding team can't. Yeah. So I really appreciate that um, uh, perspective that I gained from him and that knowledge. So that came from a Facebook message just being like, hey, I, I just love what you're doing. Like he picked up the phone um, and started talking to us. Um, and that's, and now we go from here. Now I'm getting, te- we get text messages like, I love you guys. Like, <laughs> uh, from our lead investors. Uh, not, not all founders can say that like investors can yeah. be stressful. Like they're looking for a return on their money. Um, but, uh, to get tax like that is great. Yeah. Now, that's exciting. Uh, Patrick is not actually my story. It's Jade's story. Um, we did our pilot venue out in Spruce Grove, uh, with, uh, the Grant Fear Arena and the Spruce Grove Saints. Yeah. And um, Jade was actually on site that day. I wasn't. I had uh, another commitment that I, I was at. And anyway, Jade was standing by our, we have these banners standing by these order signs. And um, I don't think he recognized Patrick at the beginning. He didn't. And because uh, he, he told me, he's like, yeah, this guy was really cool. And I'm like, you were talking to who? Because <laughs> I knew exactly who it was. <laughs> um, uh, and so basically what had happened was, uh, Patrick had seen our sign was standing in line. He was watching, I think his son was referring, refing, um, the game out in Grand Fuhrer that day, or a friend of his was a uh, kid. I can't remember who it was, but it, he was coming to watch them officiate the game. And he saw our sign. He's like, Oh, okay, well, I'm going to take a note of who I am, who's in front of me there. And he scanned our QR code, placed his order and got his food um before the person ahead of him had even ordered and he's like this is a no-brainer and so he struck up a conversation with jade and he's like let's talk and uh here we are oh that's really cool yeah it's it's funny right like just the the opportunities when you're open to them and also like you said earlier on in your advice around you know just uh not not being afraid not to be shameless right like to Mm -hmm. to reach out to to people out of the blue and and have those conversations so Yeah. yeah a huge potential um trajectory changes because of those two moments in time right yeah. so i i'm really curious so with this uh unicorn investor uh or multi unicorn uh investor i guess uh it, it, can you share his name uh with everybody yeah or? yeah yeah his, uh, he's on our deck and everything like that uh his name is rick white uh he founded fusion i his last uh unicorn company was i believe was fusion io he founded that with steve wozniak the co-founder of apple yeah um and uh, he also worked uh, with various different venture capital firms um, where he cut his teeth and um, started a few other businesses that were acquired and whatnot. But, but with uh, with uh, Fusion, uh, it IPO'd at something like $1.8 billion, and then they sold it to SanDisk for $3.9 billion, I believe. It, don't uh, don't take me as record, but I believe that it, I believe it was about three point nine billion dollars that it uh, was acquired for. So it's massive, um, very successful, wealth of experience, and like honestly, complete, like incredibly down to earth. Yeah. So so tell me, what is the top advice uh, that you would have received from Rick then that you can recall that you can? Is there anything that stands out? Um. Yeah. Um. I like my biggest thing um, because he's done it before and I have a young family is like, how did you manage being a startup found? Like, what would you do different? Um, And I believe he said something like, I I wish I would have spent some more time with my family. Interesting. Yeah. Um, It's a tough balance, right? It is a tough balance. And then like a lot of it is just like, well, how do you, how do you, how did you handle the, how do you handle the ups and downs? And um, I like, I like this answer a lot. It's uh, keep your hands and feet inside the ride at all times. <laughs> okay. So what exactly does that mean to you? Um, 
there's really like you're gonna have ups and downs um oftentimes i i'm a like i said i'm an optimist by nature and like i'll start the day like ah ready to go take over the planet and then um you grind through the day and then you're like okay and so it's 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 trying to keep perspective is like the days of grind but um like i i posed this a couple days ago um i like asmr like content like really relaxing content on like online and stuff and the weirdest one is rock polishing (laughs) (laughs) and like just think about like the perspective of that rock that rock is being ground down and beaten and smashed um for sometimes weeks and multiple times and stuff like that but at the end of it it's it's smooth it's pretty yeah and people want to display it right so like the the in the moment can feel like really crappy um but as you go forward if you're doing the right things it's going to be worth it at the end so just trying to keep that perspective is like right now might suck but like i'm not working for right now i'm working for later yeah. 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 I, I love that analogy. So what about Patrick? I mean, this guy has, uh, you know, proven himself as being just an exceptional leader and, and uh, operational guy. And so what kind of operational advice does he give you? And, and that, that really stands out that other people might find useful as well. Yeah. So um, relations, like talking with uh, sports teams um, and like, um what makes sense for the business and uh just how things work in the sports business has like been the biggest benefit for me is uh, every industry is different and both me and my co-founder we weren't from the sports industry right i was a teacher um my co-founder was uh, he is a serial entrepreneur at this point but he came from a different tech company and prior to that was a pan- was a was a paramedic hmm. um So what we've really, we like surrounding ourselves with people who've done it before and learning from their experiences. And so um, posing a question like, Hey, this is the opportunity that we have right here. What, like, how would you go with this? Right. Uh, What would, if you were in this position or have you been in a position sort of like this? So trying to gain that experience uh, and learn from other people's mistakes versus learning from our own. We've yeah. learned, I've learned enough from my own experience, my, <laughs> my own mistakes. Uh, I love learning from other people's mistakes. So then I don't have to make them. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise it's a very expensive, uh, uh, you know, practical MBA, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what keeps you up at night then? Like, what are you worried about at this stage in your business? Um, for me, it's all about user activation and, and recruitment. Mm-hmm. Uh, our, I, I well, am the technical co-founder of the team. I came, I used to teach computer science and everything like that. And so I've been very focused on, on develop. We've been very focused on development and making sure that the product um, is scalable and is meeting what our users have said, our initial users have said over the last year. Um, And now it's taking those lessons and scaling it to a higher user base and getting people to discover it. Right. Yeah. Um, Our, our app is highly sticky. Um, we have a, a incredibly low churn rate, um, which is great to see considering how we're not everywhere, right? And in mm-hmm. the places that we are, we have limited, we've had limited availability because it's been p- pilots and, and testing, right? So, but the users have communicated that they like it. We have high user ratings uh, on the app stores um, and people are keeping the app and utilizing the app. And it's it's been great to see. So what challenge do you have to overcome, do you think, to get to that place where um, things are just, you know, you're you're hitting the targets, you're hitting the the big goals that you have in terms of that user adoption and venue adoption? Yeah, so people like we're fortunate that convenience apps like Uber and DoorDash and all that have been around for close to a decade, if not a decade or more now. Um, So people are, especially through the pandemic, got used to using apps of convenience. Right now, uh, it's changing that behavior in context in the venues and understanding that you don't have to stand in line. Like my like goal as a, like our goal as a company is imagine no lines, right? Imagine no lines. Everything is done in the background. You like how? Like what else could you do with that space? How could events be different? And because uh, like live events have not changed, 
live events like in reality have not changed for thousands of years mm-hmm. you, go, you sit down you leave to go get whatever you want if there's a concession or anything like that so live events haven't haven't changed but like imagine where we could go if you if your venue isn't designed to manage the flow of people but like how to how people can have different spaces within that venue right Mm -hmm. like imagine like you have a bar and you can go like you turn your venue into the world's biggest sports bar or like the the city's biggest sports bar versus just lining up to get your drinks yeah yeah Yeah. So I, I'm curious, like when you did, when you plot out your SWOT analysis, right, you're looking at the the potential threats that are out there. Um, the You mentioned the door dashes and the uh, Ubers of the world and that. What's preventing them from jumping into the same space? Because they're, they're in the other areas of app, you know, the convenience apps. Um, uh, and so I would think that it would be a, a natural or easy extension. So is there a big threat there? And how do you, you know, basically keep that threat at, under control or at bay? Yeah, so um, we have a few different things, uh, not all that I will give away in uh, in, yeah. in this sort of call, but um, I, I personally think competition is great. Uh, first of all, it proves that there's a market. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, in terms of Uber, there's also Lyft, right? So um, even though Uber might have a dominant share, there's a ton of of um, ocean for everybody, mm-hmm. right? Um, are we going to get 100% of the market? No, right? People use Bing over Google. I I wouldn't, but like anyway, um, other, there's there are other options. And while I think that we have the tools to be a dominant or the dominant player. Um, I feel like our tech um, is portable enough and easy enough that it gives us an advantage, um, as well as we have multiple different niches. Uh, we have food and beverage, as well as retail merchandise on our app that other ones don't, um, as well as uh, we have some uh, business models that are unique. Yeah. And and would it be safe to say that the the big focus at this point is to try to gain the market share before any of the competitors get in um, so that you can, you know, basically it's a land grab at this point, I would think. Is is that fair to say? Yeah, that, that's fair. Um, yeah. It is a land grab. Um, the churn rate is really low. Like once it's a complex market to enter, lots of our venues are multi-stakeholder. You're dealing with the, not only the team, but the food and beverage, you're dealing with the city and often in a lot of cases, levels of government. Um, so it, it is not an easy market to get into, which is a great little moat for us. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It creates a nice barriers to entry for others. And so if you can be the first mover in that space, right, you're going to have a mm-hmm. big advantage. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I like it. Now, if you were to write yourself a letter, so you've been working at this for 27 months, I think you said before we hit the recording, right? So, yep. um, so if you could write yourself a letter and send that letter back to you 27 months ago, what would be in that letter? Um, let me think about that for a second. Yeah, for sure. A um, lot of stuff that I've just said, uh, that I've said throughout this thing, I, I'd be writing to myself. Um, there's a line that Mark Rudolph said in his, like, he's got a podcast actually titled about it, like, that'll never work. Hmm. Um, and some of the best ideas are actually bad ideas. Yeah. Right. Um, and a lot of, a lot of going through this is, um, you're going to go everywhere and like, you're going to reach a level that like, for me personally, I feel like we've reached a level that I didn't, I dreamed of. Right. Um, but didn't think I was going to get to yet. Like it's, it's hard to comprehend that. Um, but it's going to feel like you're spinning your wheels a lot of the time, right? It's about, it's like making steady progress. Um, so it's just like learning a new skill. It's just like, um, get uh, increasing like fitness and everything like that. It's the day-to-day might hurt, but it's the results over time that are worth it. Um, Mm -hmm. is probably what I would say to myself. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's a great piece of advice because isn't that 
it's so true. And it's just like what you were talking about with the analogy of the rock and that, right? Like when you're in the middle of that tumbler. <laughs> yeah, it sucks. <laughs> yeah, it really, really sucks. Uh, but at the end of it, you're going to have something that, uh, you, you know, really demonstrates the, the the work and the effort and so on that you put into it. So, yeah, it's really exciting. Yeah. So, well, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show, uh, Evan. Where can people find more out about order um, or about yourself if they wanted to connect with you? Yeah, so um, you can visit our website at uh, order.io. That's O-R-D-R dot I-O. Um, you can visit us uh, on any of our social media pages, which is Order Eats, so O-R-D-R Eats, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, we are also on LinkedIn, if you search up Order um, on LinkedIn. I pretty much add anybody on LinkedIn, so you can search me up on LinkedIn. Um, I'm pretty active on there. Um, as well as you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram at this is the Evan. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show today, sharing some of your journey with our audience. And for those who are listening today, if you enjoyed this episode, and you want to check out some of our past archives, head over to amplifyyourbusiness.ca. That's where you're going to find them all. And if you're watching this instead of listening to it, you can um, head over to your favorite podcasting platform if you prefer to be able to you know, be a little bit more mobile as you're taking in the content and just search Amplify Your Business and you're going to find the podcast and all of the major platforms platforms there. So thanks again, Evan, and uh, good luck with everything else that you're doing. Thank you so much. Pleasure is all mine.